Today is Friday, uh, February 4th, and this is William Michael of the Classical Liberal Arts Academy. It's a rainy day here in North Carolina, and so uh, rather than take my afternoon walk as usual, uh, I'd like to uh, address a topic that I intended to talk about in a walk talk, but I'm going to do it from my office, so if you notice the sound is a little better, it's because I'm actually uh, working indoors today. I posted yesterday on uh, social media that I was going to take some time today to uh, talk about what's wrong with these Catholic individuals like Taylor Marshall, Michael Voris, and you can probably name uh, another three or four of these online personalities who speak about Catholicism to Catholics and spend most of their time trying to find fault and criticize the hierarchy of the church and lead individual Catholics to disobey the actual teaching and judgment of the hierarchy of the church. I'd like to get into some of the details of what's wrong with this whole message, what's wrong with the spirit of these men. I know that there are men who in the church, priests, bishops, uh, even the Pope himself, who have addressed this false idea of Catholicism that's present in the messages of these men. Uh, but I'd like to get into it a little differently, because I think that sometimes the leaders of the church address these issues in a responsible pastoral manner uh, that's proper to their places in the church. But I'd like to address these issues on a, a simpler level as a layman speaking to fellow laymen, because I think that the issues that lead people to find these anti-pope and anti-bishop messages attractive are problems that laymen tend to struggle with, and those in the clergy don't necessarily struggle with. And so I'd like to address these issues from some historical, philosophical, and biblical perspectives. So I'd like to address the question directly, what's wrong? What is spiritually, theologically, philosophically, morally wrong with this message of people like Taylor Marshall and Michael Voris who spend all of their time daily attempting and working to publish criticism of the Pope and the bishops of the Catholic Church, as well as other Catholic people. There are a couple of principles that I think mark these men, and there are some symptoms that we can look at and, and see these underlying problems signified. First of all, for all of their interest in ecclesiastical affairs, in liturgical matters, these men have chosen to not be a part of the clergy of the church. These men are not ordained. These men have not received holy orders not even to the diaconate. These are men who are not a part of the clergy in the church. For some reason, 
They have so much interest in ecclesiastical affairs, but that interest isn't of the nature of that interest that leads to religious vocation. Something strange. Something strange. Secondly, another symptom that we see that's sort of a red flag is that these men present themselves to an online audience, primarily of laymen, and they present modern academic credentials to recommend them to their listeners or readers as if academic credentials are some sort of authority or authorization to teach and speak to Catholics about matters of Catholic faith, morals, liturgy, prayer, and so on. So we have these two red flags that should make us think twice. Why would men, both of whom had the opportunity to be members of the Catholic clergy, Michael Vores, as far as I know, is a single man to this day. He's got a homosexual past that he, he's talked about, so I don't say that to discredit him as a Catholic man. But he's not married and there's no explanation for why a man with such interest in matters of worship and liturgy wouldn't have pursued an opportunity in the Catholic clergy to actually serve the church and handle these things directly. And secondly, for Taylor Marshall, he was ordained in the Anglican church, the church of Henry VIII, the, uh, the, the, the center of English Protestantism. He was ordained in the Anglican Church and chose to convert to Roman Catholicism, but not to make use of the opportunity to serve in the Catholic clergy. He had the opportunity, but didn't make use of it an opportunity that was made available to Anglican ministers by Pope Benedict XVI, but chose not to make use of it. And yet both of these men, having chosen not to enter into the clergy, have spent their time meddling in the matters and affairs of the clergy. That's red flag number one, and like I said, red flag number two is presenting modern, secular, academic credentials as some sort of recommendation that they have expertise or authority on the matters about which they speak. So two red flags that give us a clue as to where to begin to look for the problem in the message and methods of these men. Now, these men are popular, just as Martin Luther and John Calvin were popular, just as Arius was popular. False teaching is always popular, just like sinful behavior and sinful culture is always popular. Protecting your children from the influences of modern sensual culture is very difficult. And the reason why is because false teaching and false practices are always attractive to our fallen nature, to our, our flesh. We are inclined to sin. That's one of the effects of the fall, one of the effects of original sin. We are inclined to sin. 
And the apostles taught us that the appeals that are made to us come from the world, the flesh, and the devil. And these appeals that come through false teaching are always attractive because they appeal to our sinful inclinations. Just like delicious food is attractive to us. Or a beautiful woman would be attractive to a man and tempt him to adultery. The things that serve our sinful desires that we are supposed to resist by the grace of God are always attractive. And it's no surprise that they're popular, that they gain followers. Now we have to try and diagnose what it is about this message and these methods, not just the message, but also the methods that is effective, that, that causes them to gain a quick following and become popular. I'll argue and, and prove that these criticisms of the hierarchy of the church appeal to human pride. They're attractive because we are inclined to arrogance and pride, and any message that strokes our pride will be easily received. It's simply attractive to the flesh, to our sinful inclination. And if we can present something that's pleasing to our pride and has an appearance of being true, it can be all the more readily accepted because we already desire to accept what appeals to our pride, but our conscience and reason objects to it and leads us to resist obvious temptations. But when the temptations are not so obvious, when they have an appearance of reason, then they become more difficult for us to resist. The temptation being more deceptive is more difficult to resist. So I'd like to look into the nature of this deception or temptation. Remember, St. Ignatius of Loyola taught us that the devil is a sophist. And in a society that doesn't study the art of reasoning, it's no surprise that sophistry is very effective among those who don't have the ability, because, simply because they haven't studied, not because there's anything intrinsically wrong with them, but because they haven't studied the art of reasoning where these things are taught and clearly understood. And because there are men who, rather than help them to identify false arguments and protect them from false arguments, men instead exploit their ignorance of the art of reasoning, we have this problem develop. And, and men are easy, it's easy picking for a clever person, an eloquent, articulate, and very diligent person to deceive large numbers of people because in our generation, men are not studying the art of reasoning. It's easy to deceive. So what I'd like to do is talk about the underlying issues that are at stake when men listen to these critical messages, to these mocking messages, 
and scoffing, gossipy messages from men like Taylor Marshall and Michael Voris. And if you look at their YouTube channels, look at their websites, it's like looking at the National Enquirer. It's just a constant stream of gossip stories, a constant stream of attempts to gain viewers, listeners, readers by sensational, controversial topics, images, and so on. It's just like the National Enquirer. The problem is that the way that the modern digital media market works is that you don't have to have people like what you write to make money off it. Ads don't care if the people who watch your YouTube videos agree with them or like them. Ads pay based on views. It's a very simple algorithm. If you can get views, you will get paid by ads. And you will notice that any time you watch these videos that criticize the Pope or the bishops, ads are running in the videos. And money is being made off the views. Again, it doesn't matter whether the views are coming from people who agree or from people who disagree. The money comes from the views. And this is why shock and controversy and gossip and scandal make for such great YouTube content. Because people love gossip. They can't resist clicking on a link that looks scandalous or controversial or juicy, just like the National Enquirer. When you're standing at the checkout in the grocery store and you see the gossip magazines, you can see how they appeal to just lazy, carnal interests. They're designed like that. It's strategic. It gets attention. It appeals to everything in us that's inferior. And as many men do not have grace, everyone is inclined to this evil kind of pride and gossip. And these publications, we've watched them make millions and millions of dollars for decades and decades, and the same tactic is employed by this quote-unquote, ministry of exposing the scandals and faults of the members of the hierarchy of the church. Clicks equal money in the ad-driven social media or digital media market that exists today. But what's actually wrong with the message? After all, if the message was true, the methods might be justified and the popularity might be a good thing. But what's actually wrong with this message and methods? I'll talk about the message first and then the methods second. What I'd like to do is uh, recommend to you an article that I posted last night. It's on my personal blog. It's not on the Academy website. If you go to catholicclassicist.wordpress.com, it's a simple blog that I keep where I like to post thoughts that I, I don't want to share directly on social media because they're posts that I'd like to keep a hold of and not have them just disappear into the Facebook feed or whatever. But if you go to Catholic Classicist wordpress.com or if you go on on my Facebook uh, page there's a link to the article last night titled the Lord's anointed and in that article which I wrote at four in the morning so 
bear with any typos. In that article, I address uh, the issue, the central spiritual issue with this whole church criticism culture that exists today. And again, the article was titled, uh, The Lord's Anointed. And what I'd like to do is ask you to join me in a meditation on the life of David in the Old Testament. Now, why David? Why is David uniquely significant in the Catholic life? There are dozens of Old Testament and New Testament characters we could look at, dozens of uh, hundreds of saints we could look at. But why David? Why, why is David so important? Well, King David in the Old Testament was a uniquely gifted individual. God himself said in the scriptures that David was a man after his own heart. God loved David, and God recommended David to us. He taught us to look at David and learn from David how to live because David was a man with God's heart. David thought and acted in a godly manner. God himself tells us so. Now, what's more important about David is that David was a prayerful, worshiping man. He was a devout man. He wasn't an academic. He wasn't just a zealot. David was a spiritual, devout man who composed over a hundred psalms, spiritual songs, spiritual prayers that were presented in the form of music, because David was also a musician. And so in these psalms, we have the heart of a man whom God approves, expressing the desires and feelings and longings of that heart in music. These psalms became the content of the worship of the temple in Jerusalem. The Psalms of David provided the content of true worship in the temple. Our Lord himself, in his life, on multiple occasions, quotes the Psalms. In fact, on the crucifix, our Lord quotes the Psalms because they express the heart of a man who loves and serves God. When Jesus says on the cross, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He is quoting the words of David in the Psalms. The Psalms are a divinely inspired source of prayer and meditation that will direct our spiritual lives according to God's will, so that we may develop by the recitation of the Psalms, by the meditation on the Psalms, we can develop the heart of David ourselves. That's the purpose of the book of Psalms. That was the purpose of the Psalms in the temple in ancient Israel. When the church was founded after Pentecost and into church history, the Psalms remained the focus of Christian prayer. The Psalms remained the focus of the incessant prayers of the church. 
the divine office, which is the official system of prayers of the Catholic Church, is essentially a daily recitation of the Psalms. The Psalms of David remain the core and focus of Catholic spiritual life. In the modern church, after the Second Vatican Council, the Liturgy of the Hours was published as a revised form of the older divine office, and the Psalms retained their central place. 3,000 years after the Psalms were composed, they remain the focus of the spiritual, devotional life of God's people or at least they're supposed to. All the faithful are called to participate in the Liturgy of the Hours, and if they do so, they will be immersed in the Psalms of David. One of the reasons why men are uh, not attracted to the Psalms, why they don't find the recitation of the Psalms helpful is because a they don't have the heart of david and b they're not familiar with the details of the life of david which put the psalms into context for us any spiritually minded catholic man who actually practices the devotion provided by the church, whether in the older divine office or in the modern liturgy of the hours or going back to the writings of St. Benedict. If you visit Clear Creek Abbey, for example, you find nothing but a community of Benedictine monks reciting the Psalms. So no matter where you go, the Psalms are the focus of those praying according to the mind and direction of the church, any time in history. And this devotional life focused on the Psalms will lead us to be imitators of David, to have the mind and heart of David. Now, the reason I say this is because if we as Catholics are praying as the church teaches us to pray, we will be drawn closer and closer to the heart of David. And what I'd like to show is that what these men are doing in modern circles, criticizing the Pope, finding fault with the leaders of the church, speaking out against ordained members of the clergy, what these men are doing is the exact opposite of what King David would do. The spirit that drives these men is not the spirit of the Psalms. It's not the spirit of David. And I'd like to demonstrate that. That's not my opinion. That's a demonstrable fact that I can show you from sacred scripture. And I'd like to do that. And in this article titled The Lord's Anointed, I, I provide the appropriate scripture passages, and I'd like to talk through them as we discuss this together. Again, for most Catholics, the knowledge of the Bible is limited to the Gospels or maybe some of the writings of the New Testament. Very rarely do Catholics have a, a working knowledge of the history of the Old Testament. And it's unfortunate because there's so much to gain from the Old Testament. But Catholics don't spend much time studying it. And that leaves them ignorant of the lives of some of the most wonderful men who have ever lived. Men like Abraham and Moses and Joseph and David. But most of all, I think, David. 
whose life, as I said, is commended to us as a model of what true worship looks like. Now, when we recite the Psalms in the Liturgy of the Hours, we spend a lot of time reciting with our own lips and meditating with our own minds on the thoughts and words of David. Some of the Psalms were not written by David, but were still written about David. When we pray evening prayer, assuming that we're praying evening prayer, and this is where I think the problems come in, is that Catholics are not actually praying as they're directed to by the church. They're not cultivating this true spirit of devotion, which is not some modern church idea, but which is the devotional life of all of the saints and doctors of the church through history. By not reciting the Psalms, by not participating in the divine office, Catholics are not being formed according to the heart and mind of David in the Psalms. In Psalm 132, which we recite in evening prayer, the Psalm opens with the words, O Lord, remember David and all the many hardships he endured. Lord, remember David and all the many hardships he endured. And you can see how the Psalm draws our attention to David. Lord, remember David and all the many hardships he endured. And the next logical step for us is to ask, what hardships? What hardships does this Psalm refer to? What hardships did David endure? Because obviously these hardships are significant and they lead to this prayer, Lord, remember David and all the many hardships he endured. I'd like to walk you through some of those hardships which are recorded for us in the Old Testament, in the book of 1 Samuel, starting around 1 Samuel chapter 15. In the, in the book titled 1 Samuel, the book is titled after the name of the prophet Samuel, who lived in ancient Israel. This is before the time of the temple, before Solomon built the temple, before David became king. Samuel was anointed by God as a prophet, a spiritual leader among the Jewish people in ancient Israel. And yet at the same time, God appointed a king to rule over the Jews politically because the Jews requested a king. And through the ministry of Samuel, or I should say by the authority of the prophet Samuel, Saul was anointed as the king of Israel. It was a religious ceremony where the king received his temporal authority from the prophet who represented God. Now, Saul struggled as king. Saul was a blessed man. He's spoken of in the scriptures as being taller than everyone else, stronger, handsome. He was the ideal political leader. Men looked up to him. They admired him. He was an impressive physical specimen. But his authority to govern came from the prophet Samuel, who was a holy and wise man. At one moment in Saul's life, he faced an enemy, an enemy people known as the Amalekites. And as he was about to fight these Amalekites on behalf of the people of Israel, he was told by God through the prophet Samuel 
to kill all of the Amalekites and to completely destroy all of their possessions. He was commanded by the prophet to kill the Amalekites and destroy all of their possessions. Samuel, however, leaning on his own understanding and forgetting his actual role, didn't like the counsel of the prophet Samuel. And so Saul chose to disobey Samuel. He chose to spare the lives of some of the Amalekites, and he chose to keep some of their possessions. And what's very interesting about this act of disobedience is that when Saul seeks to justify his actual disobedience to the prophet's command, he does so with an argument based on religion. Saul's excuse or justification for disobeying the command of the prophet is that he believed that keeping the possessions of the Amalekites would allow for a great sacrifice to be offered and that God would be glorified by this amazing sacrifice of the possessions of a conquered people. This is the delusion of false religion. Men who are not ordained spiritual leaders thinking from their own interests according to their own desires disobey the actual commands of those who are actually ordained as spiritual leaders and authorities. And they do so under a deception that's based in an idea about religion. They use an appearance of religion or a concern for the glory of God to actually disobey God's commandments that come through his appointed leaders. And I can't emphasize this enough because this is the essence of false religion. This is the religion practiced by men like Taylor Marshall and Michael Voris. These are men who have no authority to teach in God's name or speak in God's name. These are men who have no authority to tell people how to worship God or what is glorifying to God, what pleases God, because God has already appointed men to do this. God has already established a church. He has already ordained the spiritual leaders for his people. And what these men do, like Saul, is they disobey the actual commands and judgments that come from those men who are actually appointed and authorized to speak on these matters. And they justify their disobedience by appealing to some imaginary concern for the worship of God. This is the false religion of Saul in the Old Testament. Using religion to justify the disobedience of God. Using an argument based on some concern for God's glory to actually disobey God's commandments and disregard God's appointed ministers. When Saul does this, Samuel the prophet confronts him. And he says this in 1 Samuel chapter 15. Samuel says this 
to Saul. He says, Does the Lord desire holocausts and victims? In other words, does the Lord ask you for sacrifices and not rather that the voice of the Lord should be obeyed? Obedience is better than sacrifices, and to hearken or listen rather than to offer the fat of rams, because it is like the sin of witchcraft to rebel, and like the crime of idolatry to refuse to obey. Samuel exposes Saul's false religion. God has never asked Saul to offer him things. God has never taught this idea that Saul seeks to fulfill by his disobedience to God's actual commands, by his disregard for the word of God's actual appointed prophet and representative on earth. I'll read those words of Samuel again because they expose the evil of this whole message. Samuel says, Does the Lord desire sacrifices and not rather that the voice of the Lord should be obeyed? For obedience is better than sacrifices, and to hearken than to offer the fat of rams, because it is like the sin of witchcraft to rebel, and like the crime of idolatry to refuse to obey. Saul's desire to worship God according to his own judgment is compared by Samuel to be like witchcraft or idolatry. It's not cute that Saul claims to love God. It's not cute that Saul pretends to have an interest in worshiping and glorifying God. The way that God is glorified is by obedience, not by sacrifices, not by gifts, not by offerings, not by, quote-unquote, beauty and splendor of men's own judgment, but by obedience to the commandments that the Lord himself gives through his appointed ministers. Disobedience and disregard for the hierarchy that God himself has established is as the sin of witchcraft and like the crime of idolatry. It's not cute because it can be explained away with an appearance of religion. True religion is about obeying God. The Proverbs teach that the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. Obedience is the only true worship. God himself has established the church. God himself has established the apostolic succession that has continued in an orderly manner from the time of our Lord when he first appointed Peter as his vicar on earth and the first pope, which all Catholics acknowledge, until the present day when that line of popes and bishops from St. Peter and the other apostles down to the present college of cardinals and bishops in the church have elected and appointed bishops and popes in an orderly and undisturbed manner for 2,000 years. Pope Francis is the successor 
of St. Peter the Apostle. The bishops in the church, in communion with the Pope, are the successors of the apostles. There is no other church. There is no other apostolic succession. There is no other religious authority. The Pope and the bishops in communion with the Pope are the church, are the successors of the apostles. They are the appointed ministers of the Christian faith, chosen and ordained by God in the church. Just as Samuel was appointed and ordained prophet in Israel, the Pope and bishops are the appointed ministers of the worship of God in 2022. Anyone who disobeys them or disregards them is like Saul in the Old Testament. Does the Lord desire your sacrifices or whatever else you offer him, your special music, your beautiful cathedrals, your fancy ceremonies, your beautiful vestments? Does the Lord desire these things and not rather that the voice of the Lord should be obeyed? Obedience is better than sacrifice. To hearken rather than to offer the fat of rams or whatever other extraordinary offerings you wish to make. Because disobedience or to rebel is like the sin of witchcraft, and to refuse to obey is like the crime of idolatry. Now, remember what I said before. The reason why disobedience is attractive to men is because it strokes our pride. This truth that God's will is for us to obey, that means to subject our desires, subject our will, even to subject our intellect to the authority that he establishes by his own power, that obedience is humiliating and difficult, just like confessing our sins to a priest is humiliating and difficult. That humiliation, that voluntary humiliation, is a sign of grace. It's a sign of a heart that cares only about salvation, that isn't out to glorify itself, isn't out to justify itself, isn't out to defend itself, but wants to be saved. People who want to be saved humble themselves because salvation is entirely dependent on God's mercy. And Jesus says to us, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. When he teaches us the Lord's Prayer, Jesus says, that we're to forgive others as we desire to be forgiven by God. And he warns us, if you do not forgive those who sin against you, neither will God forgive your sins. Salvation is entirely dependent on forgiveness and mercy. And God warns that he will only forgive those who forgive, and he will only show mercy to those who are merciful. Those who desire salvation humble themselves and accept any terms because they dread the loss of hell. I mean, they dread the loss of heaven and the pains of hell. And they recognize at the same time that their sins, anything that they do contrary to the commandments, offends God. And that's the source of contrition, which is the spirit of the Christian life. 
a spirit of humility and contrition, not arrogance, not this smart-ass criticism, not this modern love of, of sarcasm and satire, which modern Christians like to pretend is the means by which the Christian message is spread through the world. This spirit of mockery and scoffing and criticism isn't consistent with the spirit of lost, fallen men whose only hope of salvation is the mercy of God. This arrogant spirit is not the spirit of David. Lord, remember David and the many hardships he endured. Now, we haven't learned yet of the hardships of David, and they begin after Saul's sin, because after Saul disobeys Samuel, and remember, Saul is the king, and he's subject to the prophet. When he chooses to disobey the prophet, God tells him that the kingdom will be taken away from him. Samuel warns Saul of this, and after this, Saul goes on an insane F attempt to preserve his power, to defend himself. And this is what false teachers and schismatics do. They, they shift into survival mode, where the end of saving themselves and doing their own will, saving their, their own image, becomes the end, the obsessive end of their life, and it just leads them to further and further sin and self-destruction. This is why we see so many of these self-appointed critics of the pope and bishops ultimately crash and burn. A good example is Father Karapi. We see them crash and burn and almost go crazy. And that's what happened to Saul. Samuel tells Saul, the kingdom will be taken from him and given to someone who will obey and respect authority. So God speaks to Samuel and tells Samuel to go to a place because he's going to show him his chosen king. God is going to send Samuel to anoint Saul's successor. God doesn't take the kingdom away from Saul. He leaves Saul as king, but he appoints his successor. In other words, he takes the kingdom away from the family of Saul. Saul will remain king, but his son will not inherit that kingdom. The kingdom is given to another man, and Samuel is sent by God to find this man and to anoint him as the successor to Saul. To Samuel's surprise, it's not a man at all whom he sent to anoint. It's a boy. It's a boy, a shepherd boy, who lives in Israel. God sends Samuel to the house of Jesse, and Jesse has a whole household full of sons. And Sam, uh, Samuel looks at the sons of Jesse, and they're impressive dudes. And Samuel says, oh, of course, you know, here we have one of these men is the chosen to succeed Saul as king. And as Samuel looks over the sons of Jesse, the Lord says to Samuel, no, it's not that one. No, it's not that one. Nope, not that one. Not that one. And he goes through the whole entire group of Jesse's sons. And God says, no, it's none of these. And so Samuel asks Jesse, are these all of your sons? And Jesse says, no, my youngest son is out in the field caring for the sheep. And so Samuel goes out and finds David, the shepherd boy. And God says to Samuel, that's my chosen one. He will be the king. Anoint him. And Samuel, 
not trusting in his own thoughts or judgment because he practices true religion, obeys God and anoints this shepherd boy, David, as the successor in the kingdom of Israel. So we have that great event where David is chosen, this shepherd boy, and he's introduced to us in this way in the Old Testament. Now, remember, the psalm says, Lord, remember David and all the hardships he endured. Well, this doesn't seem to be hardship. The shepherd boy is actually anointed king of Israel. But just like when the angel Gabriel came to the Blessed Virgin Mary and told her that she would be the mother of the Savior, that message was a warning that she would suffer. Remember, Simeon says to the Blessed Virgin Mary, a sword shall pierce your heart. And Mary suffered greatly as the mother of our Lord. In the same way, this anointing of David marked David as the target of Saul's insane wrath. Saul didn't know this. Saul didn't know about David and this anointing by Samuel. Saul was a, a consumed with his own effort to preserve his own power. Now what happens in God's providence is that Saul becomes subject to an evil spirit. And this evil spirit torments Saul. And there's no relief. There's nothing that Saul can do to free himself from the torment of this evil spirit. One of Saul's courtiers, one of the men in the presence of the king, says to Saul, maybe music can charm this evil spirit. And it just so happens that these men, or this man, knows of a famous musician. And guess who that musician is? It's this boy, David. And so this servant in Saul's household says to Saul, let us go and fetch this boy, this amazing musician. And perhaps when he comes, he can perform his music and refresh you and free you from the influence of this spirit. Obviously, they believed music had that kind of power. Not any music, but this anointed music of God's chosen David. And so they bring David in, and David plays his harp and probably sings, and it works. This spirit leaves Saul alone, and David's music comforts and refreshes the king. Again, where are the hardships of David? It seems that he is just blessed with another successful opportunity. He becomes a court musician for the king. Even though his anointing as the king's successor remains a secret. Time goes on and Saul faces a great challenge politically. The Israelites are fighting with the Philistines. And in the midst of this conflict with the Philistines, the greatest warrior of the Philistine army, Goliath, challenges the Israelites to a man-to-man -man fight. One-on-one, -on -one, whoever wins, wins. Winner take all, as it were. Well, the obvious man to represent the Israelites would be Saul. But Saul has no interest in this fight. And so Saul refuses to fight. And his cowardice fills the entire Israelite army with that same cowardice. And David happens to learn about this situation, and David 
who has none of this cowardice, but is filled with faith and courage because of his true devotion to God, volunteers to fight Goliath. And of course, he defeats Goliath. David offers to fight in Saul's place and not only saves Saul's life, but saves Saul's kingdom. Again, another blessed event in David's life. What about the hardships? Actually, this is where David's hardships begin. When David kills Goliath, he becomes a hero in Israel. And Saul begins to be mocked for his refusal to fight Goliath, and David is celebrated as being the champion of the people of Israel. Saul understands what this means, and from that point, he sees David, even though David has done nothing but good to Saul. He sees David as a threat to his power. And so what happens at that point is that Saul begins to attempt to kill David. And David spends the next, I assume, few years of his life in exile as an outcast, hiding for his life, because the king and all the king's men are hunting for him to kill him. This is the hardship that David endured, or at least one of the hardships that David endured. David, the actual anointed successor to the king of Israel, who respects Saul's crown, respects Saul's authority, and has done nothing but serve and help the king, is living in hiding as an outcast in his own land, a problem and trouble that he never volunteered for, but he was called to by God through the prophet Samuel. And David had to endure this hardship. Now, in God's providence, one day David and men who were with him are fleeing from Saul and his men. Scripture tells us that Saul moved about with an army of 3,000 men hunting for David, all through the wilderness in the area. David and his men hid in a cave. And as they're hiding in the cave, in God's providence, Saul and his men come to the location of this cave, and Saul decides that he needs to go to the bathroom and walks alone into the cave where David and his men are hiding. Imagine the providence in this event. So there's David, anointed to be the successor and king of Israel with a group of his men. And here comes this evil, maniacal, rejected, deluded man, the king, right into his presence in the cave in a completely vulnerable position. David's men, speaking like men, speaking what's natural. Remember when St. Peter said to Jesus, you should not go up to Jerusalem. And our Lord rebuked Peter and said to him, you are speaking with the thoughts of men. And he said, get behind me, Satan. David's men see this as David's opportunity. And they say to him, behold, The day of which the Lord said to thee, I will deliver thy enemy unto thee, that thou may do to him as it shall seem good in thy eyes. 
David's men are whispering in his ear, David, look, God has put him right in your hands. This is the opportunity for you to fulfill your anointing as the successor. This must be the way that God intended for it to happen. Look, behold the day. God said, I will deliver your enemy to you. This is the message in David's head. Go ahead, David. God has arranged this opportunity. Go ahead, David. Do what seems good in thy eyes. That's the message in David's ears from his men. This is a temptation. This is not God's will. This is a temptation. This is the devil speaking through these men according to the thoughts of men and not the thoughts of God. To take ungodly action and to make use of ungodly methods for some perceived sense of a right or duty is not God's way. These men with David didn't have the grace to understand that, just like St. Peter didn't have the grace to understand the Lord's mission. But David was not like these ordinary carnal men. David was filled with grace. David was a man after God's own heart. David rejected their counsel. David resisted the temptation because he knew it was not God's will. So what David decided to do was to sneak up on Saul and cut a piece of his robe and keep it with him as a token, as a sign that he had the opportunity to kill Saul but didn't do so. David cuts this piece of the robe off, uh, or cuts this piece off of Saul's robe. And you can imagine David's men saw that and probably thought it was pretty cool, even though they thought it was stupid and that he should have attacked the king and killed him and seized the opportunity. David's men probably thought that it was pretty cool that David cut a piece off of Saul's robe. David, however, as soon as he cut the king's robe, felt terrible because he knew that what he had done, even at that level, even in that simple way, was not God's way, was not God's will. Saul was God's chosen king and remained so. David was anointed, but not for today. And this was not the way. And in the eyes of all of his men, David dishonored Saul. And David felt terrible about it. When Saul gets up and leaves the cave, David runs out behind him, risking his life, exposing himself in the presence of an army of men and a king that were seeking to kill him. David risks his life to confess his sin. David runs out, exposes himself, and says, May the Lord be merciful to me that I may do no such thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, as to lay my hand upon him because he is the Lord's anointed. David risks his life to confess his sin. And again, what he says is, may the Lord have mercy on me, that I may do no such thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, as to lay my hand upon him, 
because he is the Lord's anointed. David knew that this was wrong. For whatever anyone would say about Saul, for all of Saul's faults, that's none of David's business. Saul is the Lord's anointed. And David knew that as the Lord's anointed, he deserved honor from David. And David dishonored him in the eyes of his men. And so David risked his life to confess his sin. Because David practices true religion and is concerned with salvation, not his own will, not his own circumstances, not his own honor or privileges. David is concerned with salvation. And so David confesses this sin against the king. David knew he was wrong. David confessed his fault, and he sought forgiveness from a man who was seeking to kill him. He refers to Saul as his master. He refers to Saul as his Lord. And then David explains to Saul what had just happened. And he pleads with Saul to forgive him and spare him and realize that he's not an enemy, that he has no interest in competing with Saul for the crown. David says, my Lord, the king, again, addressing him respectfully, my Lord, the king, And then David bowed down to the ground, Scripture tells us, and he worshipped, he gave honor, he did homage to Saul. He said to Saul, why do you hear the words of men who say that David seeks to hurt you? Behold, this day your eyes have seen that the Lord delivered you into my hand in the cave, and I had a thought to kill you, but my eye spared you. For I said, and listen to this, I will not put out my hand against my Lord because he is the Lord's anointed. And then David says, look, my father, here is the hem of thy robe in my hand that when I cut off the hem of thy robe, I would not put out my hand against thee. Look and see, there is no evil in my hand, nor iniquity. Neither have I sinned against thee, but you lie in wait for my life to take it away. May the Lord judge between me and you. May the Lord revenge me of thee, but my hand shall not be upon thee, because it is said in the old proverb, from the wicked shall wickedness come forth. Therefore, my hand shall not be upon thee. After whom do you come out, O king of Israel? After whom do you pursue a dead dog, a flea? Those are the words of David, honoring in every way King Saul, proving himself in everything innocent and humbling himself, bowing before Saul and before all of these men, thousands of men, David, who killed Goliath and who can charm evil spirits, bowing to Saul, because he is the Lord's anointed ruler. And David, how does David think of himself? Does he think of himself as the great musician? Does he think of himself as the future king? Does he think of himself as the one who killed Goliath? No, David thinks of himself as a dead dog, a flea. That's the heart of David. This is what it means when Jesus says, 
do not return evil for evil. This is what it means when Jesus says, turn the other cheek. Men, men mock those commands today and say, what am I supposed to just let somebody strike me and not defend myself? Well, go look at David and answer that question. Go look at David who was hiding for his life from a king and 3,000 men and look and see whether David believed that he should turn the other cheek literally. Look and see what it means to David to not return evil for evil. The meaning is very clear and very straightforward, just like St. Francis taught. None of this phony interpretation that by the time we're finished with it justifies doing the opposite of what the Scripture says. That's the false religion that Saul practiced, and it's the false religion that men practice today. Pretending that somehow, by some interpretation, disobeying the actual commands of Christ is obeying Christ, or is glorifying God, or is owed to a love for the glory of God. That's the delusion of false religion. Jesus' teaching is clear. Jesus himself modeled the true interpretation of his teaching in suffering the crucifixion for the sake of obedience in all things. Did Jesus need to be baptized? No. Did Jesus need to even come into the world? No. Did Jesus need to subject himself to Mary and Joseph in obedience? No. Did Jesus need to turn the other cheek and allow men to threaten his life? Did he need to be scourged at the pillar? Did he need to allow the Romans to crown him with thorns or put a robe around him and mock him and beat him? Did Jesus have to carry the cross? Did he have to allow them to nail him to the cross and crucify him and mock him in the presence of all other people? Did Jesus need to do that? Where was Jesus' self-defense? No. Jesus taught us to not return evil for evil, to bless those who curse us, to pray for our enemies, to turn the other cheek. And those commands are to be understood and observed to the letter. David here models this true religion for us, offering, risking his life for the sake of true religion, having no thought of self-defense or self-justification for disobedience, but obeying not even a command of the Lord. Notice that what David appeals to is not even an explicit command. He says, as the old proverb says. This is not the proverb of Solomon. Solomon's not even born yet. David's appealing to some old moral principle. From the wicked shall wickedness come forth. In other words, if you do what is wicked, you are wicked, no matter how you attempt to explain it away. Wicked deeds are done by wicked men. And therefore, David argues, since I am not a wicked man, I will not do a wicked deed. Even if all the circumstances present me with a justification for doing so, I am not a wicked man. I will not make use of the methods and ways of wicked men, because I know that those who do so are wicked men. And David says, here's the proof that I'm innocent. Let God judge between us. Do with me whatever you wish. David has no interest in self-preservation, no interest in defending himself, no interest in justifying disobedience. 
He's willing to die for obedience just like Christ. This is what St. Paul teaches us in Philippians chapter 2. Have this mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who for the sake of obedience suffered death, even the death of the cross. Obedience is the only true religion. Obedience is the way of Christ. This self-justifying, self-preserving disobedience is the way of Peter when he was spoken through by the devil himself and rebuked by Jesus. This ungodly way of disobedience is what David's men whispered in his ear as Saul stood before him vulnerable. This self-justifying disobedience was the religion of Saul, which Samuel warned him was like witchcraft and idolatry. And what's, what's most delusional about this disobedience is that it claims to have as its goal the service of the one whose commands it disobeys. It claims to have in its interest the will of the one whose authorized ministers it dishonors. That's the delusion of this false religion. David had no part in this false religion, but understood that strict obedience to God's commands, strict obedience to the ways of righteousness, was the only acceptable method. And he was willing to risk his life to avoid disobeying. That's the way of David. These were the hardships that David endured. And how did, how did Saul respond? As soon as Saul realizes what happened, he knows. David's love and service to Saul is self-evident. No one needs to prove anything. Saul knows that. And mentally, Saul cannot admit the opposite. He knows the truth. But he's sinning in persecuting David. Saul responds and says, Is this thy voice, my son David? And scripture tells us that Saul wept in front of his army. The king who led these men to go and find and kill David is now weeping in the presence of David. And Saul says, you are more just than I. You have done good to me, and I have rewarded you with evil. You have shown this day what good things you have done to me, how the Lord delivered me into your hand, and you have not killed me. For who, when he has found his enemy, would let him go away well? But may the Lord reward you for this good turn, for what you have done to me this day. And now, as I know that you shall surely be king, and have the kingdom of Israel in your hand. So contrary to the arguments made by the men who do not think with God's thoughts, every perfect result came from David's obedience, just like every perfect result came from Christ's obedience. And this is, in fact, what Christ wants us to understand. The perfect ends will only come by obedience. The perfect outcomes can only be brought about by true religion. God's will 
is that we practice true religion and we leave the results to God. The end does not turn out the way that our sinful thoughts or the devil's temptations tell us it's going to turn out. We learned this in the Garden of Eden, where the devil predicted for Eve what would happen if she obeyed God and what would happen if she disobeyed God. And we see that that's what the devil does. He tries to tell us how we can bring about our own desired ends when that's not our business. Human beings are slaves to God. We are God's slaves. We're his servants. This is why the apostles identify themselves as slaves of Jesus Christ. This is why St. Paul, in, again in Philippians 2, tells us that when Jesus came into the world, he took on the form of a slave being born in the likeness of men. To become a man for God was to become a slave. We are slaves in God's kingdom. Anyone who talks about the kingdom of God has to identify as a slave. Jesus taught his disciples this. He said, after you have done everything commanded, what you should say to yourself is, we are unprofitable slaves who only, even if we're perfectly obedient, We have only done what was required of us. Christians are to live with the disposition of slaves. God is the king. Jesus is Lord. We are slaves. Jesus tells us that when we enter a banquet, and he tells us this in the form of a parable, he says, if we enter into a banquet, we're to take the lowest seat at the table. This is to be the disposition of a Christian man. And if the master wishes to have us sit in a higher place, he will come to us, he will call us, and he will bring us himself to a higher seat. And what this parable teaches us, remember this is a parable, it teaches us that every one of us is to be content in the lowest state, as a slave. And in the church, if God desires to have a certain person brought to a higher seat, God himself will do that. Through the established system and hierarchy that he's created, he will invite an individual, call an individual to a higher place. But we are always to seek the lowest place. And some may think, well, if I seek the highest place, I'll miss opportunity. No, that's how men think. That's not true. If you look in the lives of the saints, you'll often find that the saints were content to be invisible, to live in private, to live in solitude, and just be holy. And that they were literally dragged into positions of authority in the church. I'm not talking about authority in business or popularity in society. I'm not talking about political opportunities, especially in democratic society where men seek those opportunities by campaigning. In the church, God has, throughout history, called his chosen servants into higher places And they were often dragged, trying to resist and stay in their low place. Because that's the disposition of a person who practices true religion. There's no reward for serving in a higher office. There's no reward for being more popular or influential. The only reward on Judgment Day will be for obedience. And so there's no... There's no possible motivation to, to, to seek out and take a higher position with greater visibility and greater responsibility. There's no benefit in that. And no 
wise man, no devout man would ever seek out such an opportunity. Christ tells us we should take the lowest place. And if God wants us to go to a higher place, God can come and get us. I've had people write to me and say, more people need to listen to your talks. More people need to hear. And my message to them, and they can testify to this, I say, God knows where I am. If there's anything that God ever wants me to do, he can come and get me. But that's not true, what they say. God is perfectly content to have me living as I do in rural North Carolina, working from my own home office, doing my own work focused on classical education. The only time that I speak on religion is to defend the hierarchy of the church. I have no interest in religious activity because there is already an established hierarchy provided by God to do that work. And they do what they're supposed to do. In the end, the perfect result came about for David. And that perfect result was only possible because David obeyed God and practiced true religion. If David would have taken matters into his own hands, which he does, unfortunately, later in his life, he would have had the same end that Saul had. But David, by simple obedience, by trust in the Lord and not in his own methods, brought about the perfect end. And it was only possible because he respected Saul as the Lord's anointed and refused to seek his own. He refused to take matters into his own hands, refused to use the methods of carnal, ungodly men and try to justify it by some interest in the glory of God or religion. David knew better. That's not true religion. True religion does not return evil for evil, does not take up the methods of sinful men and try to justify them by some end of glorifying God or being more religious than someone else. That's the delusion of Saul. And that's, that's what's behind this false teaching of people like Taylor Marshall and Michael Voris and these people who speak out in the name of religion as if they're moved by some great concern for the glory of God and the good of the church and dishonor the actual people called by God to serve in the church with authority. That's the delusion of this method. And again, it appeals to people because it strokes human pride and makes sense to the flesh. But it is not God's will. It's not the way of Christ. It's not the way of the saints. It's not the way of David. And if you were praying the Psalms, like the church tells you to, your mind would be focused on David and you would be led to cultivate the spirit of David and know that these men do not have the spirit of David. This is true religion that we find in the life of David, that we find in the life of Christ, that we find in the lives of the saints. This is true religion. True religion is marked by obedience, not sacrifice, not concern for quote-unquote beauty or any kind of fancy culture. God is the king of the universe. He's the creator of stars and galaxies and mountains and oceans. God has no interest in our offerings. We are slaves in his kingdom. And the only thing that he wants from slaves is obedience. He wants obedience. Just like a father in a household just wants his kids to be obedient. He doesn't ask them to pay the bills. He doesn't ask them to do repairs. He doesn't ask them for gifts. When my kids ask me what I want for Christmas, I say, I don't want anything for my children for Christmas. I just want you to be good. 
I want you to love and obey God. That's the only thing I want. I have no need of anything from my children. A master has no need from his slaves for anything but obedience. God has no need of anything that we might offer. The only thing he desires from us is obedience. That's the only acceptable worship, to obey the voice of the Lord. And God's will is revealed not through some imaginary theology that we learn at a seminary or a school or through books. True religion is learned through the church. It's delivered to us in authority, within authority. God has established the church, and the Catechism teaches us God speaks to us through the Catholic Church. The Pope is the supreme authority of the Church. The bishops with the Pope in their unity are the source of the magisterium of the Church. They are not only the interpreters of sacred scripture, as was made clear at the time of the Reformation, they are also the only keepers and interpreters of anything that might be called Catholic tradition, as was recently articulated in the document uh, Custodes Traditionis, or maybe the word order is the other way around. The keepers of the tradition. They are the keepers of the tradition, not some individual layman, not some guy who gets hold of a YouTube channel. He's not the keeper or the interpreter of either scripture or tradition. And as a Catholic, you likely make this argument against Protestants all the time. They have no right or authority to interpret sacred scripture, and yet you fail to see you fall for the same deceptive argument with regard to tradition. You have no authority to interpret the tradition of the church. That interpretation lies with the magisterium, which is found in the pope and the bishops. Not a pope that you imagine from history, the living pope and the living bishops in union with the pope. Obedience to the church, honoring the hierarchy of the church, is true religion, and anything else is just the thoughts of men, not the way of salvation. Now think about it. David was faithful and loyal and respectful to a man who was known to be sinning, rejected by God, and losing his mind. David ignored all of those factors and continued to honor Saul for the Lord's sake. That's true religion. That's true reverence for God and for God's authority. David would accept no justification, no matter how bad Saul might have been, and Saul couldn't have been any worse. David ignored that because that was none of his business. His business was obedience, and he continued to persevere in obedience, regardless of the circumstances. Now, if we consider men who justify defying and disobeying and dishonoring the Pope, will any of them make the argument, or can any of them make the claim that anything that the Pope does or has done is in any way comparable to the evil that Saul is known to have done? Obviously not. Nothing that they could possibly say about the Pope would even compare to the evils that David could raise and accuse King Saul of. And yet, those evils suffered by David did not justify in his mind any disrespect for the Lord's anointed. At the same time, can these men who take upon themselves to criticize and draw 
Catholic attention to themselves in contradiction of the Pope, can they offer anything to commend them that compares to what David could have offered to commend himself? David was anointed by the prophet to be the successor to the king. David could have put that on the table and used that to justify his disobedience. David was a psalmist whose singing actually healed Saul of his spiritual troubles. David could have put that on the table as a fact that everyone knew of and might have justified his taking matters into his own hands. David killed Goliath and saved Saul from defeat in battle, probably saved Saul's life. David could have put that on the table to justify his disobedience. Though David had amazing, amazing credentials to put on the table and offer to justify taking matters into his own hands, he wouldn't. And yet, when we look at these modern men, what do they put on the table? Some modern academic degree? Nothing could be more irrational. Anytime someone offers an academic degree as some kind of credential, this can be refuted by simply pointing out the fact that we can find men with the same credentials who believe exactly the opposite of what they believe. Their credentials in no way prove anything about the truth of what they say. We can find people who teach the exact opposite of what they say with the same exact credentials. The credentials are a distraction. It's unfortunate that people invest so heavily in academic credentials and then try to use them as some kind of leverage but they have no real leverage. It's like money. They're only valuable to those who want them. They have no objective value. And to present oneself with a PhD or an STD and pretend that that somehow qualifies a person to speak on behalf of the Catholic faith against the actual appointed leaders of the church the actual successors of the apostles, only fools could possibly fall for that. And imagine, they're using those academic credentials to justify behavior that David would never justify in his own life, though he had incredibly superior credentials. But to David, he was a dead dog, a flea. That's the difference between true religion true spiritual men and these pretenders. Now, the methods I mentioned, I said I was going to talk about the message, which, if you're paying attention, is obviously false, but also the methods. First of all, godly men would never take matters into their own hands and speak against authorities, especially in the way that these men do so. These men imitate the methods of Martin Luther. What did Martin Luther do? Martin Luther had fallen away from true religion. We know this because it was noted in his life that he stopped praying the divine office. Red flag. Martin Luther abandoned true religion first, and then everything he did after that was just man's thinking. Martin Luther chose to draw men to himself. He chose to appeal directly to the common people, even though he knew that they didn't have the education or understanding to handle the issues that he raised, the controversies that he spoke about. He went to the common people because what he was seeking was popularity and not true religion. No man who actually has an education would appeal directly 
to common people and try to lead them against the authorized leaders of the church. No one would do that. It's like a teacher in a school leading a child in second or third grade to reject the religion of his parents and follow the teacher instead. Anybody would acknowledge that to be evil. That, and they would say, that teacher is taking advantage of the child. That teacher is supposed to teach the child to respect and honor his parents. And every Christian person would object to teachers trying to change the opinions of children and lead them against the teaching of their parents. And yet, when we move to church matters, we do exactly the opposite. We follow a person who claims to have learning, academic learning, and yet he appeals to the common people on an ad-funded YouTube channel and privately published books. That's the stuff of Martin Luther. When we consider the books that are published, every Catholic knows that books that are published that treat of theology or prayer or liturgy, matters of faith and morals, every Catholic knows that those books are supposed to be approved by the church because every Catholic will argue that about the Protestants publishing their own Bibles at the time of the Reformation. Everyone knows that Martin Luther was never authorized to publish books teaching Protestant ideas. Those books needed to be approved by the church. And yet today, Catholics are buying books from private publishers that have no authorization to publish the stuff that they publish, and laymen write and address books to Catholic laymen claiming to teach them Catholic faith and morals with no authorization from the church. How do Catholics allow themselves to fall for the same methods that were employed by the Protestants? They know this. They know this. They know that what they're doing is exactly what they criticize Protestants for doing. This is what it means to be deceived. Now, I could go on forever because this is such an easy issue to argue, but I think that it's clear. And I know that, like St. Thomas says, for those who do not believe, no argument will be sufficient. For those who are just lost like Saul in their own pride-fueled life of disobedience and self-justification, they will just scoff at every argument. They will scoff at every proof because they're, they're crazy. They're crazy, they're deceived, and they're on a road to destruction. And those who already know that this is craziness, they didn't need to listen to me to figure that out. The reason I share this is because I know that there are some people in between those two sides. There are people who may be sincere and don't understand. There may be some people who are impressed and imagine or, or, or question why things that the church leaders do may seem to them to not be the right thing to do. But my message is, it's none of your business. It's none of your business. And if you want the truth, and you're an honest Christian, you don't seek the truth through privately published books and YouTube channels, where people lead you to mock and disrespect and disobey the hierarchy of the church. If you want the truth, go read the scriptures. Read the church fathers. 
read the catechisms of the Catholic Church. If you're sincere and want to practice Catholicism, go to the authorized sources, not to random men who are doing things that they have no authority to do. These men are not miracle workers. These men have no authority. They can offer no proof that God has, in fact, sent them with this message. Why in the world are Catholics listening to these people? I know why. Because people who desire evil, remember what David said, those who are wicked do wickedness. And gobbling up gossip, enjoying stories that dishonor elect, or appointed officials, these are the things that sinful people do. And that's why they're attracted to them. They appeal to our flesh. They appeal to our sinful desires. They appeal to the vices that we're supposed to be fighting against. And that makes them attractive to those who are easily deceived and looking for justification for sinful, disobedient behavior. So I've already talked almost two hours. I'm going to stop now. I hope that that's helpful. I, I know for a fact that that's clear. And if anyone would like to object to what I've said, show us an example in Scripture of someone acting like Taylor Marshall or Michael Voras. Give me a name of a saint who wasn't actually authorized, but took upon himself or herself the work of publicly criticizing members of the hierarchy of the church. Show me that this is the way of saints and not the way of heretics and schismatics through history. If you'd like to provide some evidence, I'd be happy to discuss it. But I am certain that you won't. Because no saintly person, no hero of the faith in sacred scripture, no doctor of the church ever publicly dishonored, mocked, scoffed at, or contradicted the hierarchy of the church. God bless.